six months ago, I watched an amazing TED Talk, as you are now, <laughs> by Boaz Almog on the future of energy. He didn't use any hand motions. <laughs> this talk showed me just how much energy plays a role in innovation today, and how innovation plays a similar role on energy. I took the knowledge I learned from this talk, and for some absurd reason, it stayed with me. I guess that's learning or something. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> whether I just finished a test at school and was doodling, or was lying in bed staring up at my beautiful, completely blank ceiling, it would come to mind. Finally, I gave in, and the research began. A teenager who gave a talk on pancreatic cancer said that a teenager's best friends for homework and dating advice were Google and Wikipedia. <laughs> These two also happened to work for a 10-year-old kid studying the energy crisis and Tel Aviv University research papers, where Boaz Elmog worked. <clears throat> where Boaz Elmog worked. Now, I was especially fond of Wikipedia for when I need to understand a concept but didn't get some basic facts, like, you know, multivariable calculus. Through this research, I came to understand the phenomenon shown in the video, a phenomenon known as superconductivity. The field of superconductivity was discovered in 1911 by Kamerling Onis. Onis slowly reduced the temperature of mercury while monitoring its effects on the electrical resistance. He soon discovered that when, the electrical that when the temperature at negative 452 degrees Fahrenheit, all of the electrical resistance abruptly disappeared. The mercury instantaneously became thousands of times more conductive than any material on the planet at the time. Lo and behold, the first superconductor was born. Onis was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1913 for his work, but he was not done there. In 1912, Onis introduced an electrical current into a superconducting ring, then slowly reduced, er, sorry, he introduced an electrical current and then removed the source of the energy. Amazingly enough, due to the traits of superconductivity, the current persisted going round and round the ring until it warmed up. Now, we have far in of, oh, sorry. Uh, the next part in the history of superconductivity involved a German technical physicist named Wolter Meisner. In 1933, Meisner discovered that superconductors expel magnetic fields, therefore designating a relationship between superconductivity and magnetism. This phenomenon came to be known as the Meisner effect. We have far innovated since superconductors from past days to the point where we can cool a superconductor just to negative 294 degrees Fahrenheit, or the temperature of liquid nitrogen, in order for it to be usable. This is substantially cheaper than liquid helium, which is what we used to have to cool it with. Now, liquid nitrogen costs less than that of milk, which also gives us the option, while it is substantially cheaper, for us to put liquid nitrogen in our cereal. Just saying. <laughs> just saying. <clears throat> Through my research, I came to know of a material known as pyrolytic carbon. Now, I learned that pyrolytic carbon is very similar to graphite, but here we go, some big words, but with some crystalline structure and covalent bonding, or when atoms share electrons, happening between the layers of graphene, or the building blocks of graphite. I learned that pyrolytic carbon is a superconductor at room temperature, but not as well as standard, as standard superconductors. Armed with all of this knowledge, and I had quite a bit of it, I set off to apply this phenomenon to energy. But in order to understand my breakthrough, you must first understand the system behind it. Within your standard, super con within your standard conductor, there are many atoms in the way of the electrons being transferred. When these electrons collide with the atoms, they are constantly losing energy and slowing down. Therefore, just during the process of energy transfer, a large amount of energy is lost and therefore wasted, and it cannot be regained. With superconductivity, that all changes. All of the energy is transferred and none is wasted due to the fact that there are no atoms in the way and therefore no collisions. Now, within a superconductor, there is zero electrical resistance. As we learned during the Meissner effect, all of the magnetic fields, or flux lines, are expelled. The device expels these flux lines by circulating opposing currents within and therefore creating opposing magnetic fields that then cancel out the external magnetic fields. However, 
sometimes these flux lines are left stranded inside of the superconductor. They fight to get out and are constantly bouncing around. But since the superconductor works most efficiently when only the energy is moving around, it locks these flux lines in place. Here a new phenomenon arises. This phenomenon is known as quantum locking. You see, when the superconductor locks these flux lines in place, it is subsequently locking itself in place. And it, will and it will remain locked as long as cooled to the temperature of liquid nitrogen. It will remain unmoving and locked over this superconductor, uh, over this magnet, until it is physically maneuvered. This is different from, from magnetic repulsion because it will remain locked until thrown around, maneuvered, or even if you turn it around like magnetic repulsion, gravity would bring it down, but with superconductivity, it doesn't. Now, the, the, now back to pyrolytic carbon. The material that makes pyrolytic carbon so incredibly conductive is a brilliant man-made material known as graphene. Graphene is an incredible versatile and is an incredibly versatile material that conducts electricity so quickly that we are forced to use Einstein's laws of relativity for things that go close to the speed of light to measure it. Graphene is one molecular layer of graphite and, since, and interestingly enough can be achieved by using your pencil which has graphite on its tip, coloring on a piece of tape then folding it over and over again until you get to one uber tiny layer, smaller than an ant even. <clears throat> now graphene comes in a regular hexagonal pattern and why didn't I give a stock on graphene? Anyway, if that's what makes pyrolytic carbon so conductive, it looks like it's time to look into your standard superconductor to see what makes this such fantastic technology. Your superconductor, your standard superconductor that is, is composed of six essential ingredients. Yttrium, a rare earth metal commonly used in powerful magnets. Barium, a soft metal. Copper, a semiconductor. Oxygen, I can't seem to think of any common uses for it. No. Sapphire, used as a substrate, substrate to hold it all together, and finally a thermal coating to give the superconductor the function that when liquid nitrogen is poured on top of it, it cools the entire thing at once. Now for some of everyone's favorite subject, math. And lucky you, there's going to be a test. So work on that. Anyway, <clears throat> in kindergarten, yes kindergarten, you learned of a concept known as symmetry, where if you take something and maneuver it, or change it, or whirl it, skip it, bounce it, hop it, whatever you want to do, or even take another copy of it, put it back on the page, it will look the same. Symmetry is completely based on appearance. And in this case, we're dealing with rotational symmetry. With rotational symmetry, if you take an object and you rotate it, it will look the same in its appearance. Now, an example of an object that, is, that ha has rotational symmetry is a circle. So let's say we take a circular magnet. If we place a superconductor cooled to the temperature of liquid nitrogen over this magnet, something amazing happens. The superconductor gains rotational symmetry as well. And as things that have rotational symmetry do, it rotates. So as the superconductor circles above this circular magnet, there are no sources of friction slowing it down, other than drag forces, of course. So it will not decelerate and continue flowing round and round without stopping. Now the innovation, the improvement, the enhancement, the idea, the breakthrough. All of you are now full of knowledge, full of thought, and full of puns. And you are all better people than you were 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Whether here or on the other side of the planet watching this streamed live, you have benefited. Even if you are not here, whether here nor there, you have benefited. Yeah. <clears throat> Everyone within a 12,500 mile radius of those people has benefited. Yeah. Uh-huh. But now, everyone will benefit. Everyone who has ever thought, who has ever dreamed, who has ever imagined, who has ever tried, who has ever felt, will benefit. And that's a lot of people. Without further ado, I give you the future of energy, fricto adhesion. There are three key steps to achieving fricto adhesion. The first, isolating the process of superconductivity in a vacuum. You see, as the superconductor whirls above the circular magnet, it is constantly slamming in 
to other atoms, just as when electrons slam into atoms during standard conductivity, and therefore is losing energy. All of these collisions cause it to lose a massive amount of its force and momentum, and it doesn't regain it. But if we could remove all of that clutter, if we could remove all of those collisions, using a vacuum, of course, it would not have any sources of friction once and for all. It would continue to rotate no matter what. This would be true frictionless motion, which is the key source of friction adhesion. The second step is a little more complicated. Giving the superconductor, your standard superconductor, attributes of pyrolytic carbon. You see, a true innovation would take this superconductor and make it usable in any place in any environment. That would be taking this superconductor and making it room temperature. Instead of cooling it with liquid nitrogen, why not just cool it with our own air? So the superconductor within a vacuum would be able to be room temperature and we wouldn't need any liquid nitrogen. I believe we can achieve this, this amazing material, pyrolytic carbon and its incredible ingredient, graphene. I believe those two materials are essential in the creation of a room temperature superconductor. But that won't happen overnight, which brings me to my third and final attribute. Innovating the cooling system. Currently, the cooling system of, lit of your standard superconductor involves waiting for it to warm up, slow down, then literally dumping liquid nitrogen on top of it. This is barbaric and wrong. <laughs> we need to innovate the cooling system to the point where it can be sleek, efficient, and cheap, like the haircut that you've always wanted. <laughs> I propose we do this in two possible ways. First, a liquid nitrogen capsule system from within the superconductor that distributes the liquid nitrogen across it. And second, something that utilizes gravity as our friend, a liquid nitrogen drip system. I believe we're all familiar with gravity. Now, I believe these attributes will put a new face on energy, and they're just what we need in this world daily. Radical new ways of thinking. In a time of oil, coal, and nuclear waste, these are just what we need to revolutionize our power sources today. Now, what if you could drive down to the local store, fill your car up with liquid nitrogen, which costs less than that of milk, and drive across the country without refilling? What if you could plug your iPad in at night and play on it for months on end, as some of us would love to do, <laughs> without the battery dying? What if you could never run out of power? But most importantly, I raise the question, what if you could have this a year or two from now? What would you do? Thank you. <laughs>